welcome everyone. Um, we have a, a agenda tonight that's really going to be focusing on our um, ETC Next process and discussion. This is our planning night on our schedule. This is the, the first of our uh, revised workflow, so we're trying to really focus on these activities. Um, we have a visiting member tonight from the Village PC. So, Diane, welcome. Good morning. Yeah. Um, and as normal, we, we like to, any members that show up, we'd like to have you sit at the table with us and participate in the discussions. Um, it's just a nice thing to, to have, have you guys join us. Um, public comment. So we have anybody that wants to offer anything to us tonight? All right. I have no, no amendments to the agenda anyway, so we're going to move on to our ET Next discussion. Dana, you want to run with us for a minute? Sure do. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long day and it's sort of unwinding. I'll calm down a little bit. That's coffee in there, right? <laughs> yeah. It is. I can smell it. Well, we're really happy to be starting the second phase of the ETC Next project. Um, we're really glad to be welcoming you back, Sharon and Mark, um, for the excellent job that they and all of us did on the draft town plan, uh, the draft master plan for the town center. Um, just to make some reintroductions, because <coughs> we have had a little bit of a hiatus, Mark and Sharon, that's Ned. Well, you all have nameplates, so I guess I don't have to do that. <laughs> the mom, I yeah. do too. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, well, Ned lives in the village, Tom the town, Josh the town, Dusty the town, Sue the town, John? Town. Town. Diane, village. So that gives you a better orientation. Um, so where we left <coughs> off, we have this fa fantastic draft um, Essex Town Center master plan. And so what we're going to do now is write the regulatory framework for um, the town center as we redefined it in the plan. Um, this is what we would call um, being in the weeds. And, you know, a lot of time you hear, oh, we don't want to be in the weeds, but at meetings and stuff like that. But this is a time that we actually do need to be in the weeds so the people that come after us don't have to go there. And that doesn't mean that you won't have to um, analyze the regulations that we develop as part of this process against development projects. It just means that you are going to participate in creating the regulatory framework for, the new town, for this town center. And um, that doesn't happen all that often, um, especially... Um, it happen, can happen like in a piecemeal framework, but you guys are doing it wholesale. And um, that really only happens in Essex like once in a, I don't know, generation. <laughs> Joking. But 1991 was the last time that we envisioned this area of town. And then we wrote the implementing regulations and... Um, we don't often get around to planning on this elevation and then get into the weeds that often in Essex. So this is where it's going to get really fun and really exciting. Make it about a quarter of a yeah, just about. Yeah. So that's why this project this project is so interesting and fun. Um, you know, to just leave off where we got with the end of the town plan, the draft town plan process is. Um, we had a lot of, we had some community input through um, a um, focus group outreach process and a survey. And we learned a lot about um, what Essex wants to look like and be up there. Um, the survey was particularly interesting. Um, and we didn't learn anything, we didn't learn that a lot of things were totally aligned. We heard contradictory stuff. Um, we heard that um, people wanted didn't want buildings that were too tall, but people didn't want sprawl, but people wanted um, denser areas in our town center. So what do you do with that as a planning commission? 
that's really at the heart of what's hard about community planning is that when people in a, in a community planning process tell you different things, and that's what you're going to deal with as part of this phase. Um, you know, people say we want connectivity up there. That's great, but how do you cross Route 15 in, you know, a, a safe way? When people that respond to surveys and as part of the focus group in the open house say, we want it to just flow as part of this um, commuter arterial. Um, so these are the kind of challenges that are going to be for you, and um, there aren't a lot of easy answers, which is why this is going to be interesting. Um, we were told that design should respond to views. Um, the village prevent survey told us that um, they responded favorably to images that reflect traditional Vermont architectural styles and vernacular. Gabled roofs more than um, flat, but also that context and setting were important. Well, development these days can be really, really boxy. As you've seen, what we're getting up there is box. And it's expensive to do non-box, to do um, break buildings up into um, various or you know townhouses or cottages or whatever you want. It's not responsive to the market because it's too expensive to build. So what the market gives us is what we have up there, which is a bunch of boxes. So if we want. Um, cottages with porches this is the nexus that you have to write this into code and that's what's going to be so hard about it and so interesting about it and with that i'll turn it over so thank you appreciate the opportunity to come tonight obviously we'll pull up a graphic in a minute that kind of shows up the road map but Dane is absolutely right. I think the, the, the step we're now in with you guys, helping you guys out, is going to be a, it's going to be a, a, a long process. This is not a, a two-week sort of effort. This is a, almost a year <clears throat> effort, ultimately. And the most important thing that I will say that, I, that, that, we, that I, we will commit to is we want to understand what you want to do. Our job is not to impose upon the town the regulations that we think make sense. Our job is to glean out of this con these conversations we're going to have what you guys want and then try to find the best way to codify that in something that articulates the vision that you have for Essex Town Center and gives you the regulatory tools to make sure that it can happen. So it's, and it's going to be a very iterative process. And I think we'll, we'll talk about how we've sort of structured this um, because there was a lot in the ETC Next plan. There's a lot of information in there. I know you guys have had a chance to look at it. We've had some very substantive com comments from the town, from different departments in the town, all of which is really important. Some re private residents have given us some good comments as well. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of information in there. And the best way that we can think of to actually break it down into coming up with the regulations is to break down those, those critical things and work with you guys to understand what you want to regulate and what you don't want to regulate, because you don't have to regulate everything. But when we find ourselves at a, at a crossroads of saying, this is something we should regulate or not, we have to keep going back to the vision that you have for Essex Town Center and ask yourselves, if we <coughs> don't regulate this or don't provide guidance to this point, what happens to our ability to achieve the vision? And that's really kind of the, that's the complexity of this. Um, the vision statement that's actually the draft vision statement for the overall Essex Town Center that was articulated in the plans on page 22, you have it, you know, talks about for the first time really, I think in, in, a, in a clearer way for this, this part of Essex, it talks about the architectural character as being a really important component of it. So as this process goes forward, we're going to have a conversation at some point, actually I can tell you exactly when we're going to have that, it would be uh, January 24th and February 28th, <laughs> um, but we're going to have a conversation about architecture and we're going to have a conversation about heights and we're going to have a conversation about form and we're going to have a conversation about all those things. And when you guys are faced with um, the, the questions of should we regulate 
building types? Should we regulate mass of buildings and types of architectural characteristics? Um, you're going to find there, there are some people that will agree with that. There are some people that won't agree with that. Um, we have to keep going back to the vision statement saying, if you don't regulate some of these things, what happens? How do you, what, what's the consequence of not providing that guidance and regulation to assure that it does develop um, in a way that you, you see, you see it, that it's good? Um, <clears throat> I will also preface that professionally, I'm really pleased that, you know, even though this is still a draft plan, um, and, it, and it's purposely draft because we want to go through this process, so at the end of it, we can actually finish it along with the regulations you create to actually have a very tight, clear presentation of what the community want. But I've also been really pleased with it. Actually, I think the plan's already had some of the intentions that it has that we wanted it to have. Some of the conversations with staff about ongoing efforts within the Essex Town Center are, I think, are being informed by the plan as it exists today even. And that's a good sign. That's a good sign that, A, it has some resonance with, with um, the community and also that there's some, there's some truths in here that may be really useful and touchstones that we can come back to as we need to to keep, make sure we don't lose the overall um, in, you know, intention here. In terms of disposition of work, uh, Dana talked about the weeds, and Sharon will be the, the, weed, the weed eater. Yeah, she'll, be, <laughs> she'll be working out the weeds. My job will make sure that we don't lose the vision in this process. And so we sort of we kind of yin yang this this sort of effort here, uh, where we were I was involved more in the development of the of the draft plan. Sharon was sort of supportive in there. We're kind of kind of switching roles a little bit, but at the end of the day, I think what we'll end up doing is is um, you know bringing forward these pieces of the puzzle and helping you understand how they fit to the overall vision and make sure that at the end of the day we don't lose sight of that. Um, Darren, could you pull up the roadmap? I think that would be a good graphic to start off with. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. So it's not the most attractive document, but um, <laughs> we we have taken time with staff to to try to map out um, this process for you, and we are here on the on the twenty uh, seventh of of uh, September, and we've got uh, seven well seven buckets of information that we need to go through in this in this engagement with the planning commission phase um, review of the neighborhoods and district which we want to do today um, we'll talk about what that means review of the site criteria so the lot configuration setbacks building lines all of that review of, of connectivity as, as dana mentioned that was one element that did come out a lot in the discussions in the <laughs> ETC draft uh, review of open space and recreation review of architectural form and character review of uses and densities and then there's obviously some work to prepare for all that. So you can see we're breaking, the, we're breaking down a lot of the core elements of this ETC plan into its constituent parts. And our job will be to make sure you don't lose sight of the big picture in that, but it, I think it's really important to break some of these things down because you may decide um, that you are comfortable regulating these elements of site and not comfortable about regulating these elements of site. And if you aren't comfortable with regulating some things, that has downstream consequences that we need to be able to understand and articulate back to you. So you don't find ourselves at the end of the day um, unsure as to what's happening. The other thing to talk with staff about, and this is, this is, you know, I think really important, is that we will come to some, we will hopefully come to some conclusions at each one of these steps. Like tonight, when we talk about the neighborhoods, the district boundaries, we need to have some I think for this process to work efficiently and you to get to, to get to the to the end point here, we need to have some um, clarity with the planning commission that that's the right direction and we're going to say yes to this. So we are going to ask you at some at some points throughout this process to vote and say yes, that's what we're going to agree to. Now, I know that sounds sort of sort of you know Machiavellian, if you will, but I think it's really important because. If we, if we decide to, to determine boundaries for certain types of districts and then start changing them later, there's really complicated consequences of that. Not to say you can't change your mind, I'm, I'm clear about that, but, but we will try to work with you to make sure that when we, we get the clarity from you, the direction that we get from you is clear and that we can continue to march along in a way that actually makes sense. Because again, this is a building process, this is gonna build together. And just to key off of that, I would, I would want us to be very cognizant that if over the course of the pro process we come to a new revelation we may have to go back 
yep. and revisit mm -hmm. something that yep. we've already voted on because it, it doesn't make sense with regards to something we learn going forward. Right. So that's, I mean, that's yeah, I mean, and that's a fair ca that's a fair caveat, I think. But I think that just in general, we're going to try to yeah. we're going to try to get clarity with the planning commission so that we can keep moving the process along with some um, assurance on our side that we know the direction that the planning commission wants to go, and how that might how that might sort of manifest itself is uh, we're we're meeting with you almost every other meeting, so your planning meetings. Obviously, you guys are meeting on your own yeah. the other other meeting. So there may be moments in other meetings where you guys have to continue the conversation with staff, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. and that that will happen. And I, I think, and I'll jump on that again as well. We have an, a line item on every meeting, or on our uh, on our scheduled meetings to do follow up. So we may be in a point where we may not be ready to vote on something tonight, but I think we should commit to voting on that at the next meeting and closing it off and not not letting it carry over. Unless it's really drastic, I, I would ask that us as a group commit to this closure of each topic. If not on the night we discuss it, then on the subsequent meeting where we have room for follow-up discussion. I don't think we should let these drag out, drag out unless there's an absolutely solid reason to do so. Um, but that way we can we can not let something have to cycle for a full month before we get back to it. We would appreciate that because I think again mm -hmm. that would make it just make it work, and it would be easier on staff too to make sure that we're all sort of uh, moving this in the in the same way. Um, that makes sense, Ned. Because I know you you've got you want to drive a lot of this. I don't want I want no, to make sure no, this is no I I no I think I agree it's important. I, I think we <clears throat> wherever we can we need to to act then so that we don't lose the thread. Okay. I think you know we, we need to keep keep that going and even. Sometimes you know, two weeks or four weeks, we, you know, we. That's okay. The rest I mean, the, of our life goal, interferes. The goal should be to to close each subject out, the night that we discuss it. Yeah. That should be our goal. But, we do have time built into the next meeting, mm -hmm. yeah. to do a follow up. So I don't think we should vote because if we're not ready to vote, we don't vote. No, no, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think some in some of the meetings that some of the if you look at some of the tasks like architecture, for example, and uses, actually we're anticipating two work sessions with you on those particular topics because we know there are going to be a lot more things to deal with. And, you know, I also will say, and I think you can see it from the previous work that we did in phase one, we're flexible about this. So if we have to reassess some of this as we move along, we can work with staff to do that. That's not, it, we're trying to map a road, provide a roadmap so that we're all working off the same roadmap. But if we need to reassess that roadmap because of other external factors, then so be it. Um, Going into sort of the next part of this, I mean, one of the things, one of the one of the assumptions we are making in the, in this process is that the goal, the regulatory framework goal for this uh, outcome of this project is going to be um, some new code that will have more um, visual uh, accompaniment to allow for you to communicate architectural character and form and some of the other things that were sort of. To brought to forward in the ETC next draft plan. So we're making an assumption. I think it's a well-educated assumption. We've already had some discussions around, but the, the, what, the, what the regulation that you're going to create is going to look like is not going to be what you have today. It is going to be more informative and visually informative to the outcome you're trying to achieve. So we built in some process around creating the graphics and the sort of supportive materials that help, help you do that. Obviously, the plan was written to provide a good starting point for that, but mm -hmm. there will be some additional visuals that we may have to create to allow this to, to happen. And then the last thing I'll say is, and, and Sharon, please jump in after I make my point. Um, the last part of this is the regulations part of this, is we also including in that um, housekeeping, they're calling it, and um, Sharon can speak to this at length, but we have not mm -hmm. found a code in our lives. I've never seen a code yet that couldn't, have, couldn't do with a little pruning and um, that's the case with yours. Um, there are things in the code today that just we know by virtue of time or uh, you know things have changed that probably need to be looked at. Our job will be to identify some of those things and that's where staff will come in I think in, in large measure to help us uh, we'll identify what those things are so that they can work with you as well to sort of get, get through some of those housekeeping items. 
want to add something on that? Well, yeah, I would say that uh, both the, the zoning districts that we'll be proposing as part of this project don't exist in isolation from the rest of the town. And the district tables, or however they end up being, don't exist in isolation of your other zoning and subdivision regulations. So part of that audit is to make sure that any changes that we make in this section are reflected elsewhere in the ordinances. Um, Unintended consequences yeah, are not exactly. what we want to try to get to. <laughs> and, and that ranges from looking at the allowed uses. If we decide that you don't want them in the center districts, then we need to make sure that they're accommodated somewhere else. Um, looking at some of the subdivision standards and things like that to make sure that they're, everything's consistent across the board. And that actually takes more thought than you normally think when you're just starting with a bylaw amendment. Uh, so that's why we proposed a full audit of the regulations in relation to what we're proposing under the master plan. Yeah. And um, then the second part of that is, um, the other thing that's really important in there is the, is the development of some model research. So we're gonna come back mm -hmm. to you, and this will be something we'll probably do relatively soon, is come back with you to you with some ideas, models that you can see of what we think the regulation can become. Because um, visually, and just sort of, you mm -hmm. can sort of feel it. Because I think that's helpful for, you know, if you, if you have an idea what the end goal might be in mind, it helps you as we have these conversations sort of make sure, okay, I, I see where this is going, I got a roadmap, and I also got a sort of a reference point. So one of the thoughts was we'd actually come back with some some model regulations. You know, again, not we're not gonna copy them or use them necessarily as, as code, but to help you see the, the pathway forward. Right. Um, I would say too that the master plan, we recommended a hybrid approach based on the feedback we got originally. Um, so, you know, and that range is what we looked at range from a full like form based code because we were asked to consider that, uh, which would be a totally new model for the community. But again, it's something that we can present in terms of what that would look like. Uh, to going back to just updating what you have now in terms of your zoning district tables and your de design review overlay district. Um, and I think what we're proposing is that we look at a combination of those two that's specifically tailored to Essex um, so that it's both familiar in terms of how you use it in the future, but it also incorporates a lot, as Mark said, a lot of the design elements that will be new under the, the proposed regulations. Yeah, and the one thing I think, you know, certainly welcome any plan commissioner member's input, but the one thing you should always be asking us is, is if you don't understand something or it's not clear, or you sort of, you're feeling like you're just not getting it, let's talk about that because at the end of the day, <laughs> you have to know it. <laughs> this, yeah. And our job is to make this your regulation, not our regulation so it really need you need to be comfortable with it you need to feel like you can you know in the future apply it you know clear, clearly and uniformly with with consistency and if it doesn't if it's not clear through this process then I don't think it's gonna get any better afterwards so let's try to head those things off at the pass so to speak um, any questions so far okay the one thing I just want to mention is we didn't really talk about public input into the process because we had hoped we got a lot of that as part of the master plan. And we are using that master plan as the guide for this. Uh, but in terms of this process, at, at minimum, you know, the public can participate in the planning commission's work sessions. And once this is done, the bylaws such as they are will exist in a draft form. So there will also be time for public input after this process right. so i just want to make sure that people don't feel like they're cut out of the discussion um sharon Jared, mm -hmm. we, or Martin, we thought about like fire testing some of these things once we get them planning taking going to uh, like paul leary or somebody and say what what would you do with this you know where mm -hmm. would, how would this break i mean what could you how would you you know how would you interpret this or what could, could you do something that we weren't looking for um, I think that Paul, you know, Paul was on the on the steering committee for the mm -hmm. ETC draft, and I think he, he did provide a very valuable role. In I'm just that. wondering, like in, in relation to these unintended consequences, mm -hmm. right. I don't know that we. I'm sure you guys can, but it would be it would be worth it in my mind to have somebody who hasn't been doing right this 
to look at it and see what they could do with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a very good suggestion. I mean, and that's actually pretty common. <coughs> I mean, you know, obviously sometimes that's that's the engineering department in the community yeah. or a town, you know, town road crew at, you know, highway. We highway. found that a number of times. You know, we, we wanted, we asked for this, and all of a sudden, oh, you asked for this, but now you're allowing this yeah. because of the way you asked for this. I think that yeah. the only the only caveat I would put out there, and again, it's not, uh, it's not I think is the, 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 the feedback you want needs to be focused I would think would need to be focused on do you understand what our intentions are right not necessarily if you're asking a question about the consequence of the intentions that's a different matter because that goes back to the planning commission's purview like you guys want to regulate so I, I, I see that and I'm not too worried about how to ask it yet because if we want to basically I want to see if somebody can break it right, right. as simple as that how we ask how can you get around this yep. well, <laughs> I don't want to say get around it because I want to it's and more it. like keep your focus. You know, what what was our goal with this? What was our intent? Right. Is that you know is our does our is our intent valid, or is the way we crafted it valid, or is there a loophole, or is there a something that we're going to have to live with for fifty years or hundred years because of yeah. something? Or it just is there something that's really beyond? Are we doing something that's so unrealistic that people are just going to throw up their hands? Yeah. yeah. So I'm not looking to get granular on it. I just would mm -hmm. like, no. if, if in this process there's an opportunity to fire test these concepts um, with, I don't care who it is. You know, we've seen a lot of people come through. Paul's been part of this from the beginning. That's why I threw his name out. Um, but just as, a, as part of our process. So. I can certainly... Um, at some point, ask Paul as a member of the steering committee to comment. I would say we get pretty well formed, maybe in the like the public com closer to the public comment section sort of thing. But, anyways, <laughs> that's, that's that's no, I, no, that's a very good question. That's a very good um, suggestion, Chairman. I think the other thing I would say is that there's also all these other little elements that we're sort of breaking this down. There may be times in this process where you want like site criteria for example maybe want to invite some invite certain folks, folks there, in yeah. to be part of the conversation around this because at the end of the day exactly right i mean at the end of the day you guys have to be comfortable that this is going to do the job you want it to do to achieve the vision you've established at that so if, if you need if you need additional eyes on this to help make me comfortable with that that's a great thing to do and the good news is we have a we have a pretty good roadmap. i think we can be can give people enough notice and say you know uh john for example yeah. You know, we're having architectural discussion on the 28th of February next year. Could you be here for that? Because you would have, John Alder, you'd have some thing to say that would be useful to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So not to put a lot of overhead on it, but just I think that would save us some grief. Yep. Um, the other thing I would say on that point is, um, and, you know, I, you know, there is, um, I think, built into this some moments where there may need to be some pause and reflect as well. So we just need to be working with staff to to do that and it's our intention to work very closely with staff throughout this project process because we want again at the end of the day we want staff to be as equally comfortable with understanding where this regulation is going to go so that they can provide you guys eventually with the best input as to how development is achieving uh, the objectives um, okay so I think that's the roadmap discussion um, I think what would be good to do now is be to maybe we can just sort of um, focus a little bit on the on the uh, district boundaries. Could you bring up, um, I think it's page 20, uh, 54 of the draft? 24? Sorry, 24. <coughs> That's the one. All right. Yep. So as you may recall from April, uh, we had um, one of the, one of the, Kind of constructs within this pro planning process was to do, was to break the ETC up into some neighborhoods, and for the parlance of our of our conversion from a plan to zoning regulations, the idea would be that that these neighborhoods will transform themselves somehow into districts, zoning districts. Now, whether they co-opt existing zoning districts or they become their own zoning districts, that's Hopefully something we'll have a conversation around. Um, but the idea was that, you know, we, we felt that the ETC wasn't one place, that there wasn't one, you know, one district here. There was unique characteristics within the entirety of it and that there may be some value in breaking it down into some pieces so that we can capture some of that variation and variety. 
that's actually what's going on today because there's obviously different zoning districts in the EDC, but um, I think that this planning process resulted in maybe a little bit better clarity as to um, where maybe some of those boundaries were going to be. We did have some discussions, you would recall, about the conservation recreation district. That was probably the one that was the most uh, discussed uh, with the, the planning commission. There was some concern about the, the conservation recreation district in part because of uh, there's property ownership issues related to that. Uh, there was concerns about um, sort of whether that was going to um, not allow it. This part of the ETC, and this is, this is uh, Tower Road for old stage roads, so we're comfortable where we are. Um, there was concerns that, that there wasn't enough um, opportunity there. Um, that discussion also, as you may recall, brought into the, into the discussion uh, the fact that, that we know there are a lot of wetlands on that particular area and that the, the, our consensus, again, whether this is uh, the Planning Commission's desire or not, but our, our consensus was that there wasn't a lot of development potential there anyway just because of the natural resource constraints that exist. Um, that being said, I do think that coming up with some um, discussion around that would be useful because, it, again, if, that, if, that if we decide to not even include it in the new districts of the ETC, that's an option. Um, you could just say, well, that's going to revert to the underlying zoning, and, and that'll be it. Um, or we could change the boundaries and adjust them accordingly, or we could stick with the plan and, and, and deal with that. Um, just to be, get everybody reoriented a little bit, too, in terms of the district. So we have the mixed-use district, mixed-use um, south district, which is here, which includes the bulk of the Essex Town Center, Essex Center Shopping Center and, and uh, the rest of that real estate. And we also have the mixed use north, which was across the across, uh, 15. We have the residential district, which encompasses the, the bulk of the traditional single family residential development, as well as lands on the, uh, this side of, of Old Stage Road. And then we had the, uh, still never found a great name for this, but the transitional commercial uh, district, which is basically where the price chopper is, and, and it's, the, it's the interstitial land between the historic center and um, the mixed use and residential area. So this is that. It's com brown. It's brown, yeah. <laughs> what does brown do for us? We don't know. We're going to find out. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea was we, we recognized in the planning process that there was a very distinctive uh, you know, historic center. Obviously, that's already codified in, in, in zoning, and there was this, and there was this, this, you know, area in between, uh, what we could argue is a very, you know, very mixed use environment from this historic center. So there was this sort of interstitial land that had characteristics of commercial development, but also some potential for residential infill, and some potential adaptive reuse of existing buildings from residential use to non-residential use and so we felt that it had to it it seemed to be evolving and now it exists in several districts the idea was to consolidate it the zoning districts that exist within that area to make them work better together right and, and integrate the development process in that area and part of the part of the, the the impetus for that was you know there's a lot of curb cuts on 15 here and the idea that if we actually brought it all into one neighborhood slash eventual zoning district, we could have a little bit better control over how we provide access to these properties as that evolution continues. Um, as Dana mentioned, you know, the connectivity across 15 was a big issue and will continue to be a big issue. And you guys have already taken steps with the green belt and other uh, efforts to make to you know to facilitate better crossing of, of 15 in this area um, there's always a little more definition old stage road's got a crossing point there's a there's a little more definition to it when you get into the transition neighborhood it was just it's been kind of left to its own devices it's kind of evolved as it's evolved so there was a i think a, re, a good rationale from the connectivity issue to bring the to consolidate the district around uh, the, those different districts into one then hopefully through this regulatory process speak a little bit more clearly as to um, how do pro adjacent properties develop so they provide one curb cut that shares access to both lots and and that we limit curb cuts and that we we take a look at the uses that are there and make sure that there's not uses that are actually um, uh, you know work against you relative to having a lot of curb cut use like things like drive-through banks for example again not to say that we're going to 
you know, not say drive through banks, but that is a use that does drive the need for access. So that was kind of the rationale for that. Um, and then the bulk of, you know, the bulk of the, of the southern part of the um, ETC is conservation land. And we don't really see any particular need to um, modify that uh, very much other than potentially, uh, again, taking a look at it in terms of how it speaks to things like recreation. There could be some improvements in the language around the uses that are allowable and you know again again more of a modernization of the of recreation mm -hmm. versus saying recreation is not already being used in some of those areas because it clearly is but recreation in 2018 is not the same as it was in 1988 you know or 1975 for that matter so that's just some things that you yeah. want to point out here well just that um the current zoning and, and you we sent you the kind of the evaluation I did of the proposed against the current zoning but the current zoning is based on the 91 master plan and back then a lot of this area was undeveloped I think what we've tried to do in this is basically one reflect the pattern that has developed since then to recognize that uh, but also to allow for a little bit more development, especially in the mixed-use north and the expanded residential north of that. Um, so the boundaries were defined basically both in terms of the vision of the master plan, but also to recognize what's happened on the ground since 1991. Um, Can you clarify for me what I would call north is the area that's sort of the that is north. Up is up is north. Yes. Yeah. And is that that is that part included in what you're talking about? It's this. This is a district, a neighborhood within the ETC. Yes. Yeah. When residential. You north, you're talking about the. Yes, purple. mixed use of well, purple. Well, both the purple and then the yellow above that is new too. Right now, it it stops. 50, at, yeah, it stops at Old Stage Road. road. So yeah. it allows for a, a little bit of new development. Um, the other thing we looked at was the relationship to the sewer core, obviously, because in the areas where you do want more dense development, that will need to be supported. Let me pause just for a second. Mm -hmm. um, if any of you have questions, please don't hesitate. Right now, this is really it. We're entertaining questions when you have them. I don't want you to lose it. Paula was a great example. If you have a question, ask, because we're apt to lose it if, if we forget. So <laughs> hang on, Paula, right behind you. <laughs> I was here all year. <laughs> <laughs> right. and thank I you. I want you to know from 1991 to now, there's so many changes. I'm in the green and brown area uh, next to Saxon Hill. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we are not 1991. We're a very heavily used recreation area year yep. round. Yep. So Great. Great. Keep going. <laughs> all right. Um, to Paul, uh, uh, I think the, the issue is whether or not this should be mixed use north or mixed use west. Or mixed use northwest, northwest. or mixed use <laughs> left or right. I think there's a, there's a. We, I, we, just, I, we need yeah. to differentiate between those two areas. Yes, mm -hmm. we do need to differentiate. Yeah, and let's talk okay. about that for a second because that that is I think that's a really important point. We did articulate in the discussion in the in the draft master plan a, a fairly different land use pattern in the southern. the southern portion of the mixed use district versus the northern portion of the mixed use district. Um, just as a, just to, without getting into the, the weeds, I'll let Sharon do that. I'll do the weeds, but I will say it relates to the vision and in zoning the purpose statement. So when you're looking at these districts, I think in chapter six, it outlines the vision statement for at least four of them. Yeah, it does. Um, and so that's what we would be translating into for zoning an actual purpose statement that defines the reason for that zoning district and why it's different. Than the other districts, so but characteristics it just needs to be labeled separately. Well, well, need to be what, labeled let's, separately. Let's, yeah. 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 So characteristically, though, I think the idea was that as Dana was mentioning that um, architecturally taller, architecturally more diverse, probably um, architecturally larger mass um, doesn't mean all those other things that are important don't get ignored, but just generally speaking, more density here less density here, uh, a, probably a greater proportionality of residential versus more mixed use here. Um, that's kind of some of the characteristics of that. And the idea 
the overall idea behind them is that they kind of work symbiotically in terms of supporting an economically you know, val valuable mixed-use environment so that this area could provide a little more residential density to the whole of the ETC to make any economic activity here better. And it's pretty close to walk, it's pretty easy to get to, all of those things with the right design and um, a, a, you know, a consistency of applying pedestrian spaces and all that would make this a very functional uh, living environment um, relative to the overall ATC. But we felt like given the location, um, its prominence to the 15, and its proximity to some of these natural areas and such that it couldn't, it couldn't be as dense as this, but it could certainly be more dense than it is today, if you, if just as a kind of yes. overview. Diane. So, is there an overlay that you can do for the sewer core with this map? Yep. I think because actually this... Unless, unless okay, I, yep. living in the village, there's only a couple square yards um, that aren't on the sewer core um, sort of thing. And so... We have everything that has has sewer core. Right? We're on familiar with regulating. Just so that you have that context. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is: Is that sewer core in the history that I know of the town has always been a stumbling block and and halting block as to development and further expansion? of any economic activity in the town, whether it be residential or commercial. Yep. So unless there is a sewer map, okay, or what's going to be allowable sewer uh, that goes with this at the same time, same map, that you can talk about all kinds of things because I can't make that assumption that one corner is going to have, there's a perk or not. <laughs> right, no, that's a good point. So just to be clear, on page uh, 17 of the mat draft, okay, just just to, I could we can go back there after a second, but this portion of the ETC is actually in the sewer core. This land is in the sewer core, okay. and your point, your bigger point, I think, is actually we, there's been some very substantive conversations at the at the April discussion, post April discussion. Uh, with the Planning Commission previously about the issue of the sewer core. And I know though, there's been resolution of all of those issues, but I think it was a, a fairly well-established premise at the onset of this project that um, it's kind of chicken and egg. That if you, if you want this vision to be realized, this vision can only be realized if the sewer core supports it. That was the fundamental mistake, one of the fundamental mistakes of the last master plan was it didn't get the clarity around the need for aligning the sewer core with where you want growth. So I think, again, to, the, to uh, sort of let, acknowledge that the plan has actually had some value thus far, that conversation is starting and to happen, which is good. Um, the other thing I would say is that we have, and you can pull this up again, Darren, it's on page uh, 17, but the sewer core does include the bulk of the of the more dense areas of the ETC. The question that I think has not been answered yet is how much allocation can be applied in that, you know, the, the boundary is the boundary, that's important, but there's also the availability of capacity and the allocation of that capacity. So we've had a number of discussions on that and I I'd, I'd, I'd would like us not to get derailed with sewer capacities and, and future so forth because that really, I mean, Dennis has done a lot of work on that and to some degree, I think related to your chicken and egg, you gotta, we kind of have to come up with a plan, and then work to try to enable it. So we, the sewer has always been a, a factor, but it's not necessarily something we're going to solve at this table. So I don't want to get too well, deep into it. Well, the, the only reason, Dusty, that I, I bring it up is <clears throat> that if you, you can plan to your heart's content. But unless you've got some reality, how far out is this plan going to go? I understood. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, we can have pie in the sky and we can talk about a lot of different things. Um, is the vision 10 years? Is the vision 25? Is it 50? Is it 100? So, you know, and, you know, and as, as Mr. O'Leary will definitely tell you, is 
how much is it going to cost is depending on how much he's willing, infrastructure he's willing to put in. Any developer will tell you that, and I'm sure that they have since you guys meet almost every week. Uh, it feels like I'm just going to, it's every two weeks, you know, when, you know, doing that. So, I mean, that should be a... It, it definitely has been part of our discussion is what, what, I mean, and we had, I think the last time we spoke about this, it was a quite a lively discussion about, um, you know, what's realistic versus what, you know, what do we want to see versus what could we realistically see. Um, we're not going to solve it here, but we are going to potentially drive the conversation with public works and developers and so forth to set some of those targets. And Dana, if I'm missing the point, you please jump in. But if we're trying to drive, we're trying to drive change and not just maintain status quo because status quo doesn't work. Well, I think we are right here at the point where we need to consider the status quo. Um, <coughs> needs to be brought to the table. And I think that we have to talk about allocation versus boundaries, and the select board needs to be brought into this conversation. And if it's not here, when? As a, as a, as a real practical example, and I think the point's a good one, but a real practical example, if, again, we're not saying this is the recommendation, but if we wanted to say uh, to require a minimum density in any of these potential districts, Right, we couldn't. I wouldn't feel comfortable proposing that unless I felt like there was a reasonable probability that a developer could actually get the sewer density they needed, mm -hmm. because they wouldn't. We couldn't achieve it. So that would create a really useless zoning regulation, right? So there is. I think there is. But it, I would agree with you in premise that there is a little bit of chicken and egg, and I think we've got to we've got to push this forward a little bit so that you can feel comfortable that the, 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 the we have the, to put something in front of engine uh, you know public works to, to set a target can we get to it how do we get there because otherwise it's only going to be this is what we can do this is what we have we can't do any more than this right. so we've got to find a way how do we get there and we had this exact conversation of you know do we ask for what we what we can have right now or do we ask for how do we get to where we want to be and that's I think the question that we're trying to get in front of public works and also, you know, this process is going to happen at different tables at different times, and hopefully some at the same time. But we're going to be in meetings with Dennis and the select board, and so Dennis and you guys are going to have to go and talk to the select board, and the select board hopefully is going to come to some of your meetings because in terms of integrated planning in Essex right now, it can't be this linear thing where no one participates. You know, We're going to set up a in ring. Isolation. <laughs> a, a ring with ropes and pads, and, and <laughs> that's how we're going to make these decisions. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of different than the way we often do it, which is the planning commission does its thing, and then we take it to the select board, and it does its thing. Um, we really need to be more integrated this time. Get out of the fiefdom mode. But to, 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 to just make a big, very clear point, I think, again, back to the districts and the boundaries of those districts, is that I think there does need to be, a, there is alignment now on, on the, the way these lines are drawn today with the existing sewer core boundaries. So there is, there is alignment there, which I think was, was purposeful on our part. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that there was not a, not a gaping hole, like we're not suggesting higher density in areas where at least the sewer core boundary didn't exist. So I think that's something the Planning Commission should think about and say in terms of, you know, that should be the way we approach the districts in the ETC. We want them to make sure they are respectful of either the way the district is drawn today or perhaps how you think it should be redrawn in the future. That's, I think, that to me, that's a very good touchstone to get to. It's like there's clarity around that. So I'm curious, uh, is there an overlay, first of all, that shows the existing zoning map as is we have not overlaid way? those yet, no, and that's we will do that. So I, I think that's pretty critical because I know, like, for example, that you're taking away some of the historic preservation area, and without being able to see that here, unless I'm literally pulling up the map on my computer here to compare, it'd be good to have those discussions as to, like, okay, why was that decided? Why was this decided? What What is this going to gain us? Like the orange section there, you're basically combining what was previously the – the mixed-use commercial and the mixed-use planned unit development. So yes. it would be nice to have that discussion. Okay, let's like, why are we doing that? And and I think it, I don't know if it's expanding at all. It might be the same size combined, but that would be. I think that would be the kind of thing that would be a a, 
uh, product of the discussion. So you're absolutely right about the mixed use. That was that was the intention was okay. to bring those two together. As Sharon was mentioning, you know, there's a lot of overlap in those two zoning yeah, districts. Yeah, and again, it's basically to integrate the planning and development of those areas better. You had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to comment, just like what he said in the red, that the brown area, you know, right along 15, where it's all sporadic neighborhoods and then business districts. Well, there's a lot of neighborhoods along. Allen Martin Parkway and all of Allen Martin Parkway residents use the green area for recreation. Not that you don't need a sewer core, you don't need a sewer, but when you're talking about blending um, because of it's not 1988 anymore, what is it going to look like? I just wanted to comment that Allen Martin Parkway, Seth Circle, all that area, you know, by that um, 289, you know, that area all the way to Saxon. It's like we feel like we're one district, even though you have it divided between brown and green. I just want to point that out. That all of us tend to use that green area for recreation and so baby Let me show you looking at the, I, I'm not sure that we're including that in this. Well, I know, but I just wanted to give my two cents that that, okay. the, that, that part of 15, um, all the way to the Jericho line is a, community <laughs> is even though it's so sporadic with businesses and hell homes that I just wanted to throw that out so if you can go to uh, if you go to page four I, I think I can walk through this fairly easily yeah. yep while we're waiting is Pat, Patty is that your name is your name Patty? Patty. Yes. Okay. This one right? Yep. Yep. So this is the um, this is the existing zoning districts, and I think the point was raised. So just to get everyone in, here's Butler's Corners here, 15, Historic Center. Can you blow that up just a scooch? I can also. This is a little easier to see. Yeah, the, that's better. Yep, that's the one we had sent over to. Yep. I can read Okay. Uh, when, can you just zoom that up a little bit more on that? That'd be great. It's really yeah. There we go. Um, anybody's right. If anybody's red, blue, green color, well, I apologize. Um, <laughs> just to give everybody so oriented a little bit. So this is this is the, inter the interchange. This is the existing Essex Town Center. Here's that residential district. This is the center district, I believe. And so one of the things that I think it's important to recognize, and this goes back to the point that Cheryl was making at the beginning of this, is the unintended consequences of changing districts. The, e the ETC boundary itself doesn't line up with the zoning districts. They're not coincident, <laughs> which, you know, again, in hindsight, 2020, would have been nice to make that line up, but they don't. So there's actually an ETC boundary that does not actually line up with the existing zoning districts. So there are some interstitial areas outside of the ETC that would be the historic district, for example, that we're going to find ourselves having to deal with the consequence of that. Um, there also is, and this, so this is the, uh, I forget the purple here, it's light blue. Mixed use. Mixed use, mixed yeah. use yeah. yeah. So this is already, this is the PUD mixed use north. That's already basically zoned in some ways for that same use, but you can see it's the same as the balance of the um, the Essex Town Center, and it's also the balance of what the Lang Farm property. So there was a reason we came up with the idea of changing, sort of debt, reclassifying it so that it had a different um, characteristic. Um, the one big area where, the, sort of again, changing, looking at on on, on Old Stage Road is this parcel, these parcels here was looking at those as being contiguous to and near the ETC, but um, not currently as dense as they probably could be and being able to provide some residential growth there. Um, recognizing there has been an investment in crossing and walkways and all of that to accommodate that. So, and then obviously looking at the balance of this, this is the, the center district. You see the center district currently goes up, you know, quite far north. And that, that was part of the contention the discussion around whether that conservation recreation district boundary made sense because that that was at the heart of that. The fact is, is that today it's called the center district, and we were suggesting that its its planned intention was not consistent with the rest of the <laughs> center district. That it had to it, it was something else. Um, so I think that is really important 
part of this conversation. Then you can sort of see the balance of the, uh, the consolidation of these zoning districts related to that transition kind of came out of the um, center district, came out of some of these other districts. And, yeah, redefining them. Yeah, the residential business, which is this one here, and the what is the, density uh, high density residential, mm -hmm. I think, right? Yeah. So there's a it's it's kind of recognizing that there's a, this patchwork of of districts in this area and it covers most of that land. The other thing I will say, the district boundaries that are presented on the on the in the draft DTC plan do follow property boundaries. We were very clear with the fact that we didn't want to do the old oh we're 100 feet into a property and we're going to have an arbitrary zoning boundary because we thought that's we know from our own experience and yeah. certainly talking to staff that's not a, usually a desirable thing so i don't think that helps orient people a little bit more about the sort of the underlying zoning and how that kind of transforms. Well, i have a question on the property line so there's a bit of matthew town forest it sticks up to at about 15 but that um right there yeah yeah so that's in the brown Um, can you go to the, the map? Make sure. There's just the ETC boundary map. So I was going to. There's two. There's two other properties in addition to that that are similar question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think again that was. I think that was a recognition of of um, uh, the pattern that's evolved. And there is a sliver of land. You're right. There is a sliver right of way that actually. Uh, it's okay. It's a pretty gnarly ravine. Yeah. It is a gnarly ravine, yeah. And I, and I think that was part of the discussion is that we didn't feel like there would probably be much development there anyway, but for the purposes of keeping the district's boundaries a little bit clearer um, that it made some sense there. So, Mark, just to the left of where you were, right about an inch to the left, there's a property that extends into yes. right there. Yep. And that there's that long rectangular section right now that the proposed boundary is cutting off that does belong to that parcel um, to the right. <coughs> Right here. Yeah. There's that one, and then on the other side of the street, on uh, the other side of 15, the north side of 15, <coughs> the parcel that extends both the, uh, half in the brown and half in the green. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, we're, we're, if we go this route, we have to acknowledge that we're splitting properties. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I thought there was a, we'll have to take a look at the zoning data, but I thought there was a pretty good, there was a boundary there. Maybe there was a... Because in the, in the previous one, you can show the, um, both of those were contiguous in the, the zones that they were in. Both of those two parcels. Okay. So in in general, then I guess let's let's kind of walk through these if we can in, in turn. Um, you know the the question on the on the center district is, you know I think the center district actually goes over. Well, this is I think pretty consistent with the center district. If I got that right. We extended it farther down. We did extend it further down, mm -hmm. right? We did. And that was partly to recognize the fact that there was already some historic properties right. that were not incorporated in the original. Right. There was a question that came up one point earlier in the discussion about actually going even a little bit further because yeah. people felt that this was kind of the gateway. Yeah. And there was a discussion about, well, it wasn't technically in the ETC, but it might be good to, from a zoning perspective, incorporate that in because then at least the character will, will you know, kind of flow mm -hmm. along with the character. I'm not sure what the Planning Commission thinks of that. I think there's some merit to that. Um, and then as, as, it goes to, as it goes to the west, um, this was one we really had a kind of a, it was tough to figure that out, but we looked at the, our, our analysis, <coughs> looked at the sort of the character here, and there kind of was a break point as you got to the shopping center where, you know, there was some remnants of historic structures, but it did sort of peter out. The further west you went and you know it's not to say there isn't a few there are a few properties here but very less so and it got less it, it got more uh less intact um so there was a point where we just we sort of looked and said okay based upon the characteristics of the of the structures and the the form and you can you can kind of almost see it because uh, all the buildings sort of line up you know there's a fairly consistent setback from the road uh, their scale of them is pretty similar in here and as you get to this point, this I think this is um, was it the pizza place somewhere around there? Hogies. Yeah, yeah, Hoagie okay, Hoagies, yeah. There's somewhere right mm -hmm. around there. There's a transition, and that transition sort of got into this trend. This is where it became the transition commercial. Um, and some of these other uses actually have subsequently turned to. There's the, you know, there was the Tempo place that now is now a. 
commercial enterprise continues. So there's some things that are, there's a more commercial orientation to some of this. So that was the rationale for that. I think that, you know, again, looking at the, the underlining zoning, there was a, you know, the, the, the center district as it originally was encompassed, you know, encompassed all sorts of, all sorts of this, but I, it really felt like it needed to line up better with, with the historic center itself and also where the overlay, the scenic, the design overlay kind of fits. Yeah. And that's another consideration in this is that there's already a design overlay for the historic center and we wanted to make sure that that wasn't sort of misaligned with the zoning itself. Um, so if we were to, if we were to extend ETC section more southeasterly on 15, yep. off the top of your head, what, what, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to introduce another, another type of zone, but what, what group, what zone, what color would you? This here? Yeah. I would actually continue that with the center district, honestly. I think there's a good argument to be made that as you come on 15 and you get to this, the, you know, they get to this Sand, intersection. You're talking about the Sand Hill Road. Intersection. Sand Hill yeah. Road intersection, yep. right. As you get to that intersection, you know, there are a few properties there, but I think just characteristically, I mean, you're seeing the historic center. So I think it's a, it's a gateway. It's an arrival point. Yeah. Well, and, and there were some historic houses right along that. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the same thing goes with Browns River with the school district. I mean, the school is up there and the houses across the district. On Bixby Hill Road are um, also historic across the street, so it, it's actually extend up if you really wanted to get to it. To I'm not sure what the little short one is. Is it Iris or whatever it is up there? Yeah, Iris Street. I mean, it goes up. Um, oh, yeah, I recognize it. Part of it's a swamp or whatever else, but um, it but it's still part of the historic center as opposed to. Oh. Wondering why this my sorry my I'm wondering why my pointer's not working. It it saved my water bottle. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. That's a good. You know, I think that's that's a good question. I mean, again, this depends on what. Going back to the earlier discussion, making new districts. If we decide we want to make new districts and give them the definition, give them a purpose that actually aligns with your the goals, and what are the intended unintended consequences of expanding it out beyond its current. Piece. I think that would be something we can look at, but you know, I would I would argue that the arrival points into the Essex Town Center from these directions are very important, and the school is a very important sort of. I mean, you know, to me, I live in Fairfax, so I drive down 128, and this is when I first notice I'm in Essex Town Center. This is my first point of arrival, really. So I think there is a good argument to be made to say extending it to here, and then uh, you know, the question where at the school that's. There may be a little bit of discussion around that, but the school is a good reference point in my mind. Mm -hmm. for, well, at, for least the, at least the buildings across the street, I, I view of them as being part of the historic Essex Center District. Historic Essex Center District. Which buildings, Diana, are you referring um, to? There's a building across from the school that was part of the, um, the, oh, the school. The school, the school. But that's on Bixby <coughs> Hill. That's on Bixby Hill. Right up there, yeah. Yeah. So, which is why I'm saying it, it almost needs to go up to, is it Iris? Yeah. Or, or, or up that? Up to here? Yeah, up to there. Um, Where, where's the old railroad bed? That that's right through, through here, isn't it? Yeah, that's off of Towers, isn't it? Yeah. Talking about doesn't the bed? It go, doesn't it go up farther? That's right here, isn't it? Isn't that right there? No, I'm not sure. I've I think it is, it's right there. there. Yeah. It's yeah. So I, you know, again, I think one of the things, if you look at the, the, I think this is a good time to look at the, at the, you know, what actually has evolved versus what you wanted to evolve discussion. And I, I don't know, you know, there may be a historic house or two, but I think the character of this area is decidedly not, um, Historic. Historic. <laughs> historic if you like the 1950s, I suppose. But, yeah. You know, but it's no, 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 late 80s. 80s, okay, early yeah. 90s. It's not quite yeah, there yet. That's Meadows Right, yeah. Meadow, yeah, so I just think it's like, you know, re, you know it, the exercise is not always about just capturing all of the historic buildings, but, also, but trying to find where do they come in assemblage, you know, to sort of say something, and also where there might be redevelopment or changes over time that you want to sort of make sure don't make uh, unintended consequence a really bad outcome there. And I don't know if, again, I don't, I mean, I could see the school's not probably likely to change in the near term. 
but as as a as a way of, of, of demarcating the arrival point, I think that's a good ref that's a good reference point on a main road into town. Um, again, because one of the things that the zoning regulations can do is talk about what happens when you get to these gateways, and if somebody mm -hmm. does do something, there could be language that says you got to take some care in the design of your improvement because we we have a gateway, so we don't want you to turn it into something that doesn't fit that character. So I think I mean I, I don't know what the planning commission's purview is, but I think there's a good argument to be made to sort of extend it to the south to this 15 Sand Hill Road intersection. And also probably to carry it further on 128 to at least the school, at least in a corridor along this, and try to find the right property boundaries that fit that. You've got a, you've got a natural a natural uh, point as you come around the corner, going west. When you yeah. first come around the corner, yeah. Yeah. Right I there. mean that's that's where it opens up. And this land is I mean this is oh boy every every spring I go down through here it's pretty wet so I'm not sure there's going to be a lot happening but. No. Um, but above it there might be. But they're above it there might be yeah. And it's you know the point to say that there's not a lot of development happening on that side. You're not affecting much in terms of the, any, the, any consequences. And as you say, it's a good physical boundary. But it's a question of how far north and south do you go? Yeah. Especially if you're trying to align it with property boundaries. Because these are pretty deep. These are pretty deep. They go back quite a ways. Okay, that sounds like some. At the very at. least, I think the school the boundaries of the school property. <coughs> Would make sense because that's not a. <coughs> if you're looking for a demarcation, that's a, that's a reasonable it's starting point because it's not, it's, it's there. Yeah. Um, the other one that was a little, you know, again, a little tricky was figuring out the diff the, the the boundary between, the, um, transitional, commercial and, the mixed use south, um, and it does it does essentially line up with the boundary between the. Um, Business, residential business district. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's pretty much the same line. I think it may be cleaned up a little bit, but I was we were, as we were looking at it, we certainly you know we could certainly see, you know. There's no reason to say that, that, that it could go into one or the other. I mean, there's sort of a, it's kind of an arbitrary line in some ways. But that was one area of transition that we we noted. So what's going to happen with Saint Brook if we make this change? Not much. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, right now the only, there is a high, was it high, high density residential is in, is right here. It's just south of the basically north of Sunset and going out to the bike path, or rather Saybrook Road. So. Yeah. Saybrook is medium density right now. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if I can point with the mouse, apologies. Um, this is Saybrook Road. Thanks, Lori. Um, and then the, the bike where, where you have the boundary right now is the edge of the uh, residential business district. Right. So sorry, the high density residential is on the north side of that. So yeah, so Saybrook gets rolled into into the in, mix into mix you south, but in terms of density, you know, it's probably actually up up zoning it. Relative to density and all like, and that is so up zoning it from relative mm -hmm. from zoning perspective, and providing a little more uh, flexibility to uses. Now it's built out largely, so I don't imagine that would necessitate a lot of changes. But over some time, that could allow for, for some redevelopment, redevelopment yeah. or infill. There's the field down by 39. Yeah, down here. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. and they do have certain open space requirements on that property because of the um, subdivision, but. I haven't found some much clarity as far as what that could be used for. It seems like there is a little more potential for development even today, so to upzone it might lead to a little more than I mean, what scale is there, but we'd have to look at that specifically once we get to the density and the design parts of it. So that might be a question we revisit as far as boundaries. <laughs> yep. If we find that that's unsatisfactory. That did come up in some conversations, as I recall, with, you know, like the concern about, you know, the field and its value as a, you know, quasi-recreational space. I know there was some discussion at one of the public meetings about that. Um, I think it's important to remember, recognize that, um, and again, I think that the draft tries to do this in, in a number of instances, is, is that there is a hope that there will be recreation and open space 
throughout the ETC. It may have a slightly different form than what is existing today or what might be and you know perceived as being recreational space, but um, there will still be, be recreational space in any of these districts of, of different types and open spaces and such. So you know whether this remains as a, a field or does get adaptively reused as to or redeveloped into something else. Um, I my suggest my, my presumption is that there would be some requirements to make sure that there is functional, practical open space associated with that, albeit probably not an open meadow. There's another lot though too, Bernie Yendo, that comes off Saybrook Road. Yeah. That one there. Yes. This guy. Yeah. So that one, you know, this is the there's the, I think and these these also did come up as well, and we we mm -hmm. specifically put them into the recreation conservation, I think as a result of some conversations with the rec director um, about that, about the idea of wanting to make sure there was some provision for uh, future recreational opportunities within the ETC that may be more aligned with the, the community's recreation objectives. He's He's been an active landowner who's been looking to develop his property. <coughs> So I think that's a, that's a question that the, the Planning Commission should think about is, is and we can come back with, um, you know, maybe next time do the overlay of that so you can see that a little more clearly, but um, that would be something I think we could, um, you know, discuss more is should this be, um, should this be more associated with the mixed use north or s south or should it be something else? Because right now it's, it's uh, right now it's largely what medium density residential I think is. The bulk of it. I also uh, go back to the question of our, how are we aligning the district boundaries with the property boundaries. The area in the south part of the Sabre um, development is uh, the, the, the boundaries don't align with the property, the zoning boundaries don't align with the property boundaries exactly because we decided that those steep ravine areas are not developable even if they were part of that property and part of the mixed use. So that's why that decision was made. Correct me if I'm right. wrong. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yep. But as far as where those, you know, open rack, you know, recreational um, pieces are, that can also, um, you know, I don't know if we want to look at those too. As far as where those property boundaries are, and make sure that they're not spot zone. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to. Yeah. I think that you know, there's a couple things as you sort of as you look at it with some time behind us. I think this is one where there was some accommodations trying to be made to reflect. Um, some of the natural resource constraints, but also some of the goals the community had for recreation. So I think we're trying to find the right way to do that. Um, but you know, it it may be. Um, I think I think bottom line is I think there was a recognition that there would be up zoning, if you will, on portions of the property that may come at the expense of down zoning at others. But the net effect would basically be the same level of density and say or maybe slightly more level of density so just where that density is applied yeah i, I think it'd be good <coughs> to have more density where saybrook is um, but it'd be good to have some connectivity to the, the town forest too. yes yep and that certainly did come out in a lot of the conversations that we had with folks about you know like this is if you're gonna have a trailhead it would be nice to have a trailhead down here so that yeah, and that could, again, back to the open space requirements for any sort of higher density use, that would be a very, very good example of, a, of an open space. And, you know, them, them dedicating a trailhead to the town forest would be a very good thing to get out of that process. Okay, so let's, 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 let's pause and circle for a few minutes. Um, as I understand it, our charge this evening is to sort of give you guys some clarity on whether or not we agree or like this or want what we want out of it. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to I want to put some framework around this so we're not just chewing on this endlessly all night. So just sort of as a as a taking the temp, general temperature, what does the commission, Diane? I'd like your opinion on this as well. What does the commission feel about this approach and this general structure, knowing that we've we've already talked about probably asking to have the the town center not town center space the uh, uh, historic, historic. historic area whatever we're calling it. It wasn't what you. It is okay. Historic the historic, historic district center. expanded to some degree. What do what do folks feel about this approach so far? Ned, I'll start with you. Uh, I I I I don't have any 
projections to it, and I think it's probably pretty good. I, I worry a little bit uh, <coughs> where the dividing line and, and Mark referenced to where where that cuts off with the uh, brown commercial district in the middle there. I <coughs> am uh, extending this historic district is fine. I think as we develop a plan, what we develop for the historic district is actually going to be one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, we have here just because of the nature of, of what's in that area and, and, and how it could develop with, with the traffic and everything else in there. Okay. But I, I think this is fine. Tom. Ditto. You sure? I don't want you to lose your voice on this one. <laughs> I'm good. Josh. I, I philosophically like the approach, and I really like, and I think I was the one that advocated for it, actually, but the ex his expanding the historic center <coughs> to the southeast and just the whole idea of the gateway and then phasing up as you drive along 15, I'm very supportive of that, that concept. I like it a lot. Great. Diane, what are your thoughts? Um, this I, is what happens when you come to our okay. meeting, you get, you get put at the table. <laughs> All right. Um, my personal opinion is that the historic center should be expanded to, to the gateway areas. Um, I think you should color in the properties that extend out here and here. And these guys is to the appropriate colorations. I'm assuming this is, these are landforms not to be developed versus the never-ending ravine that's in there. So to make those reality, is this show what you're looking at? Um, you know, which, which district? Is it going to be rec recreational, or is it going to be the mixed-use upgrade to Saybrook? Um, and, and just bite the bullet and do it. John, i got to remember. Yeah, this is... Sorry. This is definitely, uh, it's a more of a learning experience for me. Mm -hmm. Relatively new member of the planning commission and zoning regulations and rules in general. I find myself not really knowing what I'm approving uh, versus what was in place before. So that's just my perspective. I, I can appreciate all the work that's gone into already having discussions with what seems to be the appropriate people that have that expertise to decide what we're cutting into and what we're expanding and whatnot. Personally, I don't feel like I can offer much in those areas unless I really dive into the weeds of the details. I mean, that's kind of what I feel like. If I was to review this in depth, I would look at the existing zoning regs, pull up, you know, medium density residential and see, okay, where are we changing that? And then look at, you know, looking at the what defines that today versus yeah. what we're defining in this paragraph here and seeing, okay, is that going to match up? Is it going to still do what the original intentions were and, and so on. So yeah. for me, I feel like I'm just learning. I, 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 I think it's valuable and then what I'm seeing, I like what I see. But obviously a lot of work's already gone into this, so but um, I don't have anything, uh, I guess. Well, I think you, you, you've identified a couple <coughs> points that I think are valid. One, you want to see more about, you wanted to know what, what, the, what the comparison is. I think we mentioned that also is what, what are we gaining, what are we losing? You know, by this, and that it sounds like that's what I heard. Is you're looking yeah. for really what's the net gain and and yeah, and I think you know, but but from what I've seen in the draft plan, you know, it's totally different in how the planning is done, and I think that's you know that's intentional for a lot of good reasons, but it's hard for me to compare what the way things were previously done when it's so drastically different mm -hmm. to the new direction, and I know that we're going to get more <coughs> into that with some of the later discussions. And it, I'm hoping it all comes together. But that's, again, I think it's just me being relatively new to the commission. And not really, it's and a I, I would, Before I go to Shu, I want to remind us again, if, if we, can, we can say that we like something now, and if new information comes out further down the road, we can come back and revisit and say we want to do something different. So I, I think your point of looking for more information or greater clarity down the road is fine. Shu. Uh, generally, I, I like the layout. Um, I'm a little, a little nervous about the, the area to the uh, northwest uh, of Old Stage Road. You know, getting a lot of density there, but I understand we probably, you know, one of the things we have to consider in all of this is that 
there's some available space there to get more density in this area. So just a little on the fence on that whole idea. Um, as far as extending the historic uh, center district, uh, I kind of like where the line is now. seems like a pretty good delineation. I totally agree. There's a lot of buildings and properties that are, that are you know, extending out towards Sand Hill Road and, and maybe even a little further that could be included in there. But I'm, you know, we, we got to think about, you know, what the, what are the implications of the, of the regulations that we're going to put in, in that area, you know, are we scooping up some, some, some historic buildings or historic properties? And what, if we extend it, what are the consequences of that um, on the rest of those properties? In that area? This seems like you want to, this is a kind of a nice delineation where it is. I think the gateways are good on Alder Lane there. Um, so I'm not opposed or, or anything. I'm just saying I think it's okay the way it is. Okay. Actually, well, I'm sorry, one, one point to that and that came to mind is, is do we know if there's a cost associated with changing anything? So like to, to John's point, if we think something is kind of okay right now, is are we is there a cost associated with making even a minor change to that whether it be redefining that area you yeah, know and i'm talking like hitting costs and every, you know everything that's you could say cost to whom cost to us cost to, to landowners the to the town essentially whether it be through having to redefine you know that area and and whatnot and if we if we look at the cost versus benefit of you know is it really worth our time and effort to make that change we may decide quickly that no it's not there's Let's not mess with this. Let's leave that piece alone. So, and same with like some of the densities. Like when we look and we say, oh, well, this could use more density. Well, do we, when we look at the current regulation, is it even coming close to what, how it's regulated right now? And if it's not, are we, is it worth our time and the money associated with changing that right now? That's. Uh, if I might, if I might share just a point, I think you raise a really good point. Uh, you know, there was a, there is an art, there is a, a discussion to be had as to whether or not you need to reg you need to change the uh, you know the existing zoning districts in the entirety, I mean you could make an argument one could make a reasoned argument that uh, just doing the mixed use north and south, fish districts probably has the biggest bang for your buck, because those are the areas where, there's probably more likelihood for redevelopment there's probably more likelihood for higher densities where some of the architectural discussions that the master plan are, brings forward will have the most, probable value. I'm not saying that that's the case, but you bring up, I think, a reasonably good point that you could decide that the existing center district boundary and underlying zoning and everything else is maybe with some tweaks is perfectly fine and that there's, you know, more resources put or more effort put towards some of the other boundaries. So I think that is something to be thinking about as we move along with this process. Just one little point. Um, What's funny about this map is that this looks so big, but if you look at what the town has designated as its growth center, if we were to look at it, this in the context of the, of the town as a whole, it's, it's not that big. It's tiny. And um, so we don't want to make the mistake of under-densifying this area. This is where your services and your infrastructure are. So we need to keep mindful of that. And then if, you know, if you were thinking as a regional planner, then it gets really crazy. I mean, this is, this is where it's appropriate to grow, not only in the town, but in the region. Another good point to really just echo what Dana said, the other thing that happened as a result of this draft is we've actually made the ETC smaller. Mm -hmm. It used to go all the way up to the, to the apex of Tower Road and yeah. Old Stage Road. So, again, to the point of, of recognizing, and that, and that was partly to recognize <laughs> the fact that well, we really don't want to build out Essex to the peak there, but also by making it smaller and concentrating the density in a tighter area, some of those other sort of side objectives like being improving connectivity and increasing the likelihood that the economic activity could be vitalized and stuff would actually improve. So that which is why I so, agree with that. Hang on, oh, sorry. I, I just wanted because I just wanted to go back on this for a second because. I'm in generally in favor of, of this. I, a couple points I've made up. I, I don't think we should be cutting properties in half. 
So we've got a couple of those properties, both north yeah. and south, that have extensions into, you know, they're crossing dual zones. Um, one of them's right near me, the other one's um, across from uh, um, across from my development. I, I'm, I'm concerned about expanding the historic district too much. I think we could say both sides of Alder Lane, because there's historic structures and so forth, and it's, you know, you're not going to do a whole lot on either side. It's a designation with, I don't see a lot of impact on that. I'm a little concerned with doing anything outside of the school property <coughs> uh, on that side of 120, you know, on the south side of 128, because that is, and if it's school property, it's it's covered anyways. Um, going too far close to, to, to uh, the Sand Hill intersection, we've got the Catholic Church on one side, but you've got a lot of relatively current residences you know they're not they're not historic residences across the road from that they are 1960 1970 vintage homes no, there are a couple that are older. understood but that starts when you once you get into the intersection at right at the intersection of of, of 15 and and sand hill yeah. the other ones are well, case in point i mean i just i think it's it's the, we're only, gonna, the only other thing is that that is a the the sand hill road intersection is a more natural break and I don't disagree with that. Um, I don't disagree with that at all. It's so busy. But, but we're not talking about that. I mean, again, we're, but, that, but... But visually, as you come into it, there's a, there's a change in, so, slight change in direction, so... Right, so where does the, when the state project comes through to put lights in that intersection, what is that, what's the, the scope of that going to be? So, I mean, we can pull up right up to where the intersection is going to be, and then we're going to lose, again, this isn't a big area, how much of that are we going to lose to the state state AOT when they design the intersection. So how much benefit are we going to get from it? Sharon. Hi. Would you so like to I say agree something? with you. I, I think the historic district should just stay where the boundary is. The fact that we did reduce the ETC next doesn't quite seem, I don't know, sit right with me that we're going to extend it other places and reduce it where it was. I, I think that might be a trigger for some people in those properties, but I think um, I definitely like the idea of trying to keep the uh, reduce split zoning districts. But again, I just don't think are those are those properties um, in the historic district are they on the historic register? Um, I I just think where it is is we we had a discussion at one of the ETC next meetings where we were talking about the historic district and. You know, there isn't much there, and wasn't. So you got you you got the Montessori school. You got the old Fred's IGA there. There within yeah. this designated historic district. Yeah. Um, it's hair hair appeal, all about hair, whatever it is. Whatever now. it is, all about hair. But that was Fred's IGA. Yeah. Um, that's in. Right. So. So to the Alder Lane, I think where it was, I personally like the boundary. Also, you know, just because uh, it's not part of the historic district doesn't mean that that Route 15 Sand Hill Road intersection can't be a gateway. It doesn't have to be the historic gateway. It can still be an ETC gateway. So it's another point to consider. And so, I meant people, yeah. a lot of bikers and stuff, you know, a lot of people would like, I don't go from Sand Hill Road. I'm on foot. I run, bike. You know, we're all so athletic. It'd be a nice... You know, baby people with baby joggers. You know, from that Sand Hill Road on 15th. Those babies can't go that far. When you get them jogging, they only <laughs> got husband, little feet. <laughs> my, my husband with our daughter went a 5:30 pace on the Stowe bike path. I almost killed him <laughs> when our daughter was six weeks old. But anyway, but my point is, it would give some connectivity with all those neighborhoods, and I would we would love to be part of it. That's all. So the other piece that I'm that I'm questioning on this, and I'm not, it doesn't sit well with me, is to have those two little blips of the residential recreation in that intrude into the conservation recreation. Yeah, I'd almost I just as soon just wipe that and call it conservation recreation. From my own personal point of view, I don't like seeing little blips because what are they going to do with that? Different than this, it's the recreation well, being the key piece on that. In my is, point of view, is a differentiation Macintosh Forest versus private? I I don't know the. I don't know where that delineation is. It's just for 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 clarity. I'd rather and that just leaves a little blip in between the two. Either make one parcel that's residential conservation, 
or make everything conservation recreation. It, it would be my thinking on that, just for clarity for the future people looking at this and they're not having to go out there with a sex in it to try to find out where exactly it is and get a surveyor out and you're one foot into the recreation, conservation recreation, or you're one foot into the rec residential recreation. So what would the unintended consequences be of that? No residential in that spot. So again, that, I think Tom's question about is that private or is that town forest, you know, does that mean if, if that's the case, then make it all the same, um, whatever the, whatever Saybrook is. I don't know, I just, it bothers me to see little, little, little isolated cells of one, one versus another. And I don't know the exact answer, but I'd, I'd almost rather see conservation because we're, we're, um, kind of. On the flip side of that, on the flip side of that, though, say if it, say if it was incorporated into the mixed use south, mm -hmm. you know, there are there are development constraints in the, that part of those properties. You know, there's just there are <coughs> constraints, right? So we, from a practical perspective, you're not going to be able to put much there in all likelihood. But you might be able to use it. To but you density. might be able to use the density to apply into right. other parts. So there is some potential value of of you know making that. You know, keeping it mixed use north because or south because you can apply that density, and then presumably that would become the open space or the, you know, I mean, you might end up getting the same result. I I would I mean that would I would be agreeable with that. I just don't like seeing yep. little blips. You know, I'd rather see you know as much contiguous. I believe that is that is the boundary of the forest, if I'm correct in my GIS data. That was in the forest, yeah. In that, in that case, then I would advocate more making it be the same as the Saybrook section. Okay. So you have, you could use the, you can use the, the density or whatever. Um, yeah. and there's a, there's a logic to that, obviously, mm -hmm. with that ownership pattern. Uh, where was the Planning Commission on, on this area here? I'm curious to see what your thoughts are. That we have that right now is largely in the center yeah. district. And we're considering that to be residential recreation. Yep. <clears throat> so it, you know, again, from we'll, we're going to work out density and all of the other things we go. But from a master plan level, the idea was that this would not, this would be lower density, and would not have the same characteristics as. Um, the transition or the historic center. There's, there's just lower yeah, density. Yeah, again, there are a lot of wetlands and other physical constraints in there. The question was if we allowed residential using planning and development or something to be able to transfer the density to allow higher density in the areas where it's suitable for development. But you could get some pockets of development, yeah. but not, you know, the whole thing is largely going to be remain as, as undeveloped. So back to what Diane and John were both asking about is, is that parcel, how much of that parcel is the entire parcel within the sewer core or any of it? Yeah. And actually that's, <coughs> that's a little more complicated because I think they have a touch the sewer because core. Because some of that, I think northern, the northern portion of that, I believe Gonzales have a master plan on file that can't be executed because it doesn't have sewer. Right. And that's, I mean, so there is a master plan that, that includes a portion of that extending north. Yeah. So yeah. this is in the sewer core. That is in the sewer core. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's basically everything that we've got outlined in front of us, that's in the sewer core? Um, yeah. The sewer core goes up here. Jog does not include this tract here. Okay. It does include all of this. It does include this. It, it goes across the street. Includes I, all this. I thought the sewer court didn't go up old space. I can pull it up. Yeah, yeah it's on the page uh, 17. Well, the church was outside the sewer court. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's only on one it's side, on the side, side of the road. <laughs> it's on. So it's on the east. So that might lead us to to that that section. On the northwest of Old Stage, that might want a different designation. Seventeen, you said, Mark. Yep. To allow for, you know, if the sewer core never expands to that, have it already mapped out with for some use, low density residential or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. So this is that property we're talking about. Yeah. And here's this is Towers Road, okay. Old Stage Road. 
So that additional expansion to residential is not in the sewer core. The bulk of it is. So that's a big, you know, again, that's, that's a big, that's a, you know, we're, for that particular property, we're talking about a fairly, we're suggesting a fairly substantial change. Mm -hmm. And it's a change that we think is, is, is supported by the fact that it's probably never going to develop to the density that, it, going back to your point about what could it develop on paper today versus in reality, there's a big difference. Yeah, I see the reasoning behind that. You don't want to prevent the sprawl too, right? You want to. Right. force it to be more condensed right yeah. and the, the you know the, the concern is that you know there's i guess there's a i'll say a misinterpretation or a, you know there was some thought that they the feeling that they could probably develop more densely than they actually could really achieve at the end of the day um when you start looking at the constraints on those properties and we got some mapping from anr that i think to my satisfaction showed <laughs> significant uh, encumbrances on that property and so even though, again, if you did the mathematics, if you did the mathematics based upon the number of acres and the zoning district and, and said, oh, look what we can do, the actual number you'd actually get to is, is, would be substantially lower. So I think our, our, the plan that we, we sort of suggested re reflects that and probably ends up at the end of the day giving, that, giving a density there that actually would be achievable based upon the natural resource constraints. But there was, there was concern mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's part of the original golden triangle. So that seems like it's not too smart to make the sewer core and make it concrete. But it's not. It's residential, residential recreation. recreation. It's a lighter green. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> lighter green. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, I think the point there is that that's a new district, right? So. How you want to define that is going to be what we can do in this process. So and that's we, the only section of that new district? Yes. Uh, well, there was the two little parcels the that we've just talked about retake. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I might even consider do, uh, taking that that section on old stage. That's outside the school core and make that the light Make that residential uh, recreation. Up here? Because, no, on the west. West, west, west. west stage? Oh, here. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm concerned about making the, you know putting that in the same designation as a parcel that, that already has sewer and can be built to a certain I mean we until we get well unless we want to have that discussion with the selectmen that would be a place that we might want to change in the future you know call it one thing today and then be prepared if we don't get a positive response call it something different at the end of the day because logically if you're going to have density it's not a bad place for it. agreed mm -hmm. and we started putting houses in there um i, know I mean just there is a, there i mean there is a again the, the, this the, you know the other thing to think about is the sewer core boundary is not sacrosanct either right <laughs> so you could you <laughs> Get away from him. Just <laughs> no, back. I'm like, just the, the consultant. I, I'm the consultant. I can say that. Yeah. But I mean, no, it's true. I mean, it was originally created. It can be changed. I mean, it's, it's the way things work, right? So, you know, it, it, it is conceivable. I'm not suggesting that this is a thing that you should do, but it's conceivable that you take away one area and apply to others that better fits your desired land use outcomes. So, again, I'm going to circle up again because I don't want to run out of steam we want to tonight we want to tell you whether or not we like the neighborhood um, if there's an area that we want to expand uh, that might be a, a question that that you walk away with you know what, what would be the consequences of this or not I don't have I don't hear clear consistent agreement to expand the historic section um, even though the the concept of a gateway is is good expansion of the historic section, I don't I haven't heard clear consistent support to be go beyond what's here. Um, we've talked about I've talked about getting rid of those two little blobs of light green. Um, and that really is all I've heard for changes uh, on this. 
I heard a couple extra other things. Oh, um, the property, making sure the properties don't split. Yeah, mm -hmm. making sure properties don't split. Um, also, I think what we can do for your next meeting is give you an overlay so you can really see those where those boundaries are. I think that would be really helpful for this discussion. Um, I think Sharon, did, we did include the summary table. Maybe we can dumb that down a little bit in terms of acreages. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, <laughs> to make good decisions. Yeah. Make sure that you know, so you're not sort of caught in the weeds on it. <laughs> Makes um, sense for all of us. Simplify it a little bit, probably a better way to phrase it. Simplify it a little bit just to concentrate a little bit on the acreages so you can kind of talk about the net balance of, of land in districts today versus districts in the future. That might be helpful. So you can sort of see, okay, you know, how much is shifting from one to another. We can, we can send that to you guys so you can have mm -hmm. that for your next discussion. Um, yeah, I did hear, I mean, again, maybe I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I did hear some con consensus around the idea of of looking at the historic district boundaries. So maybe the way to handle that is to blow that area up a little bit and give you a little more detail about where all the property lines are and some of the, you know, pictures of some of the uses and stuff so you can sort of make an informed decision around that. So I, if we shouldn't be splitting the property lines just to expand, you know, for the sake of expanding it. That's right. as much. Um, for the sake of clarity, I, I think I'd like to ask the commission to basically vote on whether or not we like this concept. It's not an absolute lock, but I think you've got some clear takeaways. Is that legitimate? Is anybody can, we, have... can we talk about the light green for just a minute? Absolutely. Um, so it's right between two you know, subdivisions. What, are we trying to protect that, or are we just saying, oh, since we it's wet, we might as well make it for conservation and recreation? Conservation we're, we're calling it residential, though, so we're giving it, we're identifying well, what it. What does that mean? Do, do, do you guys have density numbers as well? Yep, we do. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I'll look at the vision for that too. Yeah. Instead of as compared to straight residential. Yeah, the density was was very con uh, consistent with the um, While you're looking that up, Mark, I also want to point out that the property just east of, I um, can't tell which street this is, but um, this portion is the open space area for the residential subdivision here. So this is deed restricted in terms of development. It's not half of oh, so like half of that is. Yeah, this this is not developable. <coughs> Part of that is also wetland, but um, unless the deed were to change. The zoning wouldn't really affect that. Uh, let's see. So that whole that whole parcel out there, that's all part of that sub subdivision. About a third of it. About a third of it. Oh, that changes my thinking a little bit. What's yeah. that? Uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called. Yes. Yeah. We anticipated oh, yes. in that area a maximum of um, forty-six units. I think is the number. Those are single family. So like one, one yeah. yeah, one acre. And that would be mostly along Towers Road and sort of yes. just north of where the Brown right. is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we so do, we're actually one, looking one at but what we've been talking about. We're talking about extending the parcel that's brown up a little bit mm -hmm. to cover some of that. Yeah. This goes up. Well, yeah. But that is that split at the sewer court? No, it's not. It's all, no, it's all, it's all sewer court. But if you're not if you're not splitting property up, then that this green section here should in here. If this is part this if part of this is part of that, shouldn't this be the same color as this and put that deed restriction on here? Because because so well that no right. See I'm seeing this is the end of this development. Period. If you're telling me that this goes to here, then this section here is part of that. It's just deed restricted as to if it's going to be, can't be built on. But it's part of that condo association or whatever it is, landowners association, that then it should be. It might be permanently 
recreation, but it's part of that that property. Yeah, it's currently zoned R2. Same as that. Um, so that's not realistically showing your zoning. So, yeah, and I think it's clear, you know, we are taking that we are going from the planning area concept to zoning districts. So these are normal things right. that are going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think that's a good point. That's something we should, you know, declare it to, as we, you know, this is part of this zoning district. So, so we're essentially going to be cutting that light green in half. Yeah. Well, you know, no, taking about half, half of the, the space away. At least, yeah. yeah. Like these two little pockets chunk of it. here. Because there's also the, the chunk on the bottom, on the south from the extension of the property in. But conceptually, I mean, try not to split property lines. What's the big problem with splitting property lines? I, I actually was looking at it from a point of view of single landowner. Yeah. I wasn't looking at it so much of a view from a development perspective, but the two properties, as I understand it, the two properties that I had originally pointed out, one both on the north and one on the south of the, of the demarcation, were single landowners. And by splitting it, we're having a direct impact on a single landowner that may or may not allow them to do the development they were looking for. Well, we're anytime we make changes, we're going to impact landowners. I understand, but I, again, I was looking at it from a point of view of a, a, a single residence, not not a not a development where there's you know um, a developer that's coming in that can either absorb or deal with changes, but if if. If I've now lost the ability to do something with my property as a single owner, what's the impact to me? The single house, single yeah. residence sort of thing. So Right. But if it makes a lot of sense to have the line where it is, then the the you know, one of the demarcations for you here was the old rail bed. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so again from a logical sort of break point it felt like that was a a a good Thing in the in the out there that would actually help sort of define some of the built spaces, like you know, also the back of the price chopper kind of fit along that. Um, I think that that point that was just raised though, I think is a is a is an important one to recognize that we don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to follow property lines, but there is a I think a good reason to do it. It just makes it easier for the developer, whoever there's, if it's a, a, a professional developer or a single family you know, single property owner. And it also makes it easier for staff as they sort of look at the, the sort of the bulk outcome. But you don't want to play, if it doesn't make sense, if there was like, you know, a real compelling reason to not do that. Then. We've had challenges in the past where a portion of the property was in conservation and a portion was in residential. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of uh, West Sleepy Hollow. We, we, have a, we made a regulation that allows the Planning Commission to determine how that property owner could pick. Yep. So yeah. if it's split, you can decide how they want to, how you want to handle it. With the exception of, of this area, though, for the most part, I think, you know, a couple little pieces down here, for the most part, they do follow pretty closely to the property lines, and we don't have to worry about, there's not, like, overly large lots, yep. so that mm -hmm. makes it a lot easier, so having a single zoning district in that covers a single smaller lot just a small lot with multiple zoning district is really challenging because then you have to figure out not just which one you want to pick, but you know if there's two conflicting ones, then what do you really do? And that can have a real profound effect on the outcome. Weren't the two property owners, if we're still talking about the green area, yeah, that area, weren't they in agreement with what was sort of decided in, the, in what we were talking about? I don't recall any agreement from the property owners on the north side, and I don't believe the property owner that I was referring to on the south side has been involved with this. No, um, um, Jeff Lyon and Sally Fleury. My recollection was that Jeff is, yeah, I think, no. the, if I remember, the chair last time said, be part of the process, keep yeah. coming back, and we'll talk about it. I think that was my rec le le recollection. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, ma'am. Um, one of my clients, um, going to your point, um, lives in the yellow section, and um, I, I do her garden. And um, her bro uh, husband, Brian, was telling me that green area that you, that you suggested should be part of the yellow. Um, <coughs> like they don't allow hunting, I guess, in that whole green area because all the houses, it's just a field, you know, near their house. But I think you made a good point that that should be demarcated yellow so that 
conservation people know where the boundary is. You know, if they want to hunt on the rest of it, they'll know that a chunk of it is part of the yellow. Because my client lives right on that edge of that green area, but in the yellow. And I think it's a really good idea what you, you said. Well, it, it gives you a false sense of, of what's there. I mean, right. You, and people need to feel safe. <coughs> well, Just to be clear, all this area is within the no discharge zone, so there's no shooting oh, okay. a lot anyway. Right, right, right. Okay. So but I'm just going back. But when it comes to recreation space and you're looking at it, yes, it may be recreational space by deed restriction because it's declared open space, which, you know, period. So you can't, even, you've already said that you can't build there. So if you, you know, you need to know those pieces. Right now I'd look at that and say, okay, you could do something with that. But no, now you're telling me you can't do something with that. It's part of the yellow space. Okay, it's, it needs to be part of the yellow space. Yeah. That makes sense. Just playing devil's advocate, though, uh, I mean, I understand it from a property standpoint, but from a functional recreational use, you can develop it for types of recreation. So the recreation residential district may allow more types of re re um, recreational use, and again, it would still be restricted by whatever the deed says. But there is a potential that, that you could do more for recreation in that district than you could in a residential district. So again, it's also defining what uses, what types of recreation are going to be allowed within that that parcel. So as an as a good, it's a good. But, but is, if it's pro, okay. hang on, hang on a second. Is it owned by the association? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So done deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the but point what if the association wants to develop it for types of recreation that may not be allowed in the residential district? That's the point, I think. Is the, and the other point is like you get, could come back and say, okay, we want to turn it into a park. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that, again, the recreation residential district probably would allow for the development of that as a park. I don't think that would, that would negate their, uh, their open space requirements if it, its use was a park. So I don't know what the specifics of their agreement are, but the, right. The general but you may not allow for a larger park scale park as a type of open space within a residential district. Well, actually, it's not. District. Yeah, the definitions really matter there because I mean mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things. Again, this process will. One thing we will be getting to. It's on one of our agendas is to talk about open space and parks and and there right now you don't have enough um, clarity and types mm -hmm. of those things to capture all of the possibilities that go along with them. So. I think there is, you know, again, they, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, as it, as it functions today, it's open space for that planned unit development. But I think Sharon's point is also true in that if at some point they would like to say, then say the residents go, we really want some sports fields to do there in that facility. And they, all the neighbors want a ball field or soccer field. It's not foregone conclusion that you could actually do that under the residential district today. You, I think you could for that development though not open to the public but that's my point they maybe they want to open for the public right right. <laughs> right. Then, right then you can so that's the kinds of things that i think that would you know that's one of the reasons i think that that in trying to capture it relative to a neighborhood the idea was that that portion of the etc would be largely focused on lower density residential would there probably be some accommodation for recreational assets i, I guess my point is that that's somebody's backyard mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All these people in here, this is their backyard. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you're regulating what they're going to do in their backyard, you've already regulated what they're doing in their front yard. Now you're telling them what they can do in their backyard. Yeah, although you already told them that, that their backyard can't be done anything but what it currently is. So why not put it here? Because you've got this spot. I'm assuming that's also deeded open space. That probably. was green at one point. Yeah, yeah, it was. So, but it's yellow now. Yep. So how is that different? They're both open recreation, but one's yellow, one's green. Well, again, it's it's defining different types of open space, and some will would be allowed in some districts and wouldn't be allowed in other districts. So it become a type of use. And it'd be important to make sure that whatever that ends up being, that, you know, if it's, if it's more of a regional recreational use, it probably wouldn't be allowed in a 
residential open space district or ty would a type you, of would residential. Would you guys be willing, district. able, I mean, would you feel comfortable if we identified areas such as that parcel mm -hmm. and the parcel um, that's currently purple? If we were to say tonight, we like this plan, but those are going to be dotted lines or those those are oh, going yeah. to be shaded yeah. areas for the time mm -hmm. being. We don't, mm -hmm. we're sure. not sure how we want them locked in yet. Mm -hmm. I, mean, no. I think there's validity in in in, in everything we've talked about so far yep. you know is there we may get further in the line and diane this this is like what john was saying we may get further down the line and say it makes sense to have that be yellow or hey it really needs to stay green mm -hmm. yeah yeah no, no 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 don't feel don't feel in I any way i actually think that's a good approach yeah. use dotted lines for a bit until and i think that that area the and the and the area to the southwest of uh um of uh not not southwest the, the the thank you that area over there you can see where i'm pointing yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so another I, just, I think first off yes we don't you know that's the purpose of these discussions don't we don't want to sort of if there's something we can't lock in i think what i wanted was hoping to get tonight i am hearing this um is that the generally speaking that the boundary the sort of the disposition of these districts makes some sense and that you you know there is this again that we we haven't talked a lot about the mixed use district but it sounds like we've got some general agreement that the that's okay at least that's what I'm feeling that the mixed use north or northwest or west or purple the purple, <laughs> purple, purple district purple. is 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 a reasonable starting point for the boundary for that I would have called it west because we don't really have a west very good there you go yeah. <laughs> Are, it is west of Route 15. Sure. Is the Planning Commission okay with this? That's an area that I would like to remain as a dotted line or shaded. That's, okay. That's, yeah, that, one. that would be the one that if we don't get positive reception to discussions about sewer core, then that, I think, needs to be a different, a different designation. Enough. Okay. Great. Great. So that's, the, yeah, that was, you know, we really wanted to, that's the conversation tonight we wanted to have. So, that's so I'd actually like, I think, to formalize this to some degree as we go through and I'd like the Commission to I'd like to put a vote out this final whether or not we're in agreement with this stage with what we've talked about tonight I don't care that it's, it doesn't have to be a uh, super formal this exact map but that we've we've gotten to this point we like what the staff has done we like what our consultants have done and we've identified the areas that we want to either call out for for potential changes in the future or things we want to tweak a little bit is that Anybody concerns about doing it that way? Nope. Diane, I do have, you are visiting, so this one you don't get to vote in. Um, but I've been very appreciative of your, of your engagement on this. So I'm actually going to put the motion up that we accept the, uh, what the consultants have presented or as presented tonight with the qualifying statements and discussions. Um, and we encourage them to keep going forward and, and we'll look forward to the next batch and the next modifications. Second the motion. Any additional discussion on that? Anybody want to tweak that at all to make the... I think this has already been said, but I think um, what's going to be critical is when we get into what I think is the next meeting is basically a review of the site criteria. That's when we discuss about the requirements for each one of these sections that we, I think we've all acknowledged that it's possible for us to go back and say, now it doesn't Absolutely. make sense yeah. that something yeah. needs to be divided up. Yeah. So but We want to be able to essentially treat these like a checkbox yeah. as we yeah. go through yeah. that we're done this piece. Done may not be completely done, but I want to know that we're done for tonight. We can have this as an accomplishment. So all those in favor of that motion? Nope. What do you want? What do you on want? the um, center district, the historic part, did you want to continue to explore expanding that or leave it as is? I think the question, and I, I think you, you've heard that there's some, there's some consideration of is there any logical or is there reasonable expansion, contraction, whatever. But it's, it's as is right now. With the idea that it might be appropriate to, to expand it to some degree. Yeah, and, and these boundaries will not be finalized until the final zoning yeah. districts are approved. So. This vote does not finalize. No, that. it does not. This is really just to to, to acknowledge our discussion tonight and to say that this process we're we're good with this process. Okay, so. Is that the motion? We've already had it moved and seconded. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. So again, this was this was. Sure, it's on her select board. She can't yeah, help herself. I know. <laughs> That's an automatic response. Sorry. This really was just to to confirm or affirm that you guys are 
going this is a good direction great and staff and you guys are all moving in a way we're supportive of well, the dotted lines give us some more work to do too i yeah. think yeah with staff yeah. yep so dana copies. darren anything from your perspective that we need to take away it would be nice if we had some feedback for the next meeting just if we had some verbals or something about if there's any ideas on the expansion of the town's i'm going to give you some of those overlays and i think we'll send that to staff so you have it for your next mm -hmm. meeting yeah yeah we'll do some research on you know dana your voice changed <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> no, I just wanted to say I'm really liking this voting in the moment idea. Um, and so I, I thoroughly appreciate um, doing this going forward. Yeah. It's good to know where the tea leaves are flowing, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is true. It helps a lot. Excellent. So, is there anything else that we want to touch on on this, or do we want to get to minutes and other business? I'm looking at Dana for this, or D Darren, or Sharon. I think we're good for tonight. So, Mark, Sharon, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Good work. I hope we can keep being this effective. We will do our best to make sure it is. Make it easy, yeah. We're not going to guarantee being that cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure, I'm on my planning commission. I know how it rolls. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so where are we on the minutes? Bring in the dots. <laughs> Let's not talk dots. I'll get in trouble. Um, where the heck is it? Problem with they have a mouse that's really, you know, cursor super tiny. Well, the problem timing. is the problem is I, I when I dock it at work, it goes yep. to um, the monitors, and yep. if I don't, have it, it's like this. You get the minutes. Anybody got the minutes? Oh. I can get them pretty quick. He's got them. Okay, I'll take a motion of the minutes from September thirteenth. I move to approve the mo minutes of September thirteenth. Second. So moved by Tom, seconded by Shu. Is there any amendments to the minutes that anybody wants to offer? Any corrections? All those in favor of the minutes as written? Aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes carry. 6 0. Other business? Just your PC file folders um, had the notice of public hearing for the solar that you were very familiar with now on Bird Bushy's property. Yeah. That's all I have. We good? Take a motion. I move to adjourn. All those in favor? Oh, do we have a second? Oh, a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>